name's Kathy Bob. I am a member of the Commission of Nurture and Outreach for the Presbytery of Soda Valley here in Ohio. We are very glad that you have joined us. I'm going to introduce you in a moment to uh, Cynthia Rich, Holder Rich and let her take over um, our real introductions. But I want to let you know that Cynthia had contacted our commission about um, expressing an interest in sharing um, some information, particularly on Christian Zionism with our presbytery. And as we talked, we met with Les Sauer, uh, who's also a member of the commission, and the three of us decided that what we really wanted to do was offer a much bigger overview of uh, Israel and Palestine uh, and called this an invitation to conversation. Um, obviously, there are lots of subtopics, uh, and we're going to address those towards the end. Um, things about annexation and settlements, the status of Jerusalem, Christian Zionism, uh, with, the, with the hope that perhaps if some of you are interested in some of those topics, they are things that we would pursue uh, down the road. So this, again, is we're hoping is sort of an introduction for everyone. Um, I would ask those of you who have done, a lot of you have done a lot of webinars. Um, we already have started some in the chats. If you want to put um, your name and where you are from, and we'll have some sort of sense of who is with us. So if you have that opportunity to put that in the chat, um, who you are and where you're from, that would be great. And before we go any farther, let's continue on in prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to speak with partners in mission who are indeed far away. We ask that you open our hearts and minds, that we might be willing to hear your voice and your will for us as we speak of issues regarding Israel and Palestine for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Cynthia who will tell you a little bit about herself, as well as telling about um, our speakers. We'll, again, encourage you to put your name and where you're from in the chat, and feel free to use the Q&A, which you'll see also there at the bottom, as you go through, as the questions arise, and we'll have some opportunities as we move along um, to take those questions. Some we may do as we go, or some we may wait, wait till the end. We'll sort of see how that goes. So with any luck, I'm going to take myself out of the equation and um, maybe spotlighting Cynthia. And while I do that, Cynthia, jump ahead. Great. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holder-Rich. I am a minister of Word and Sacrament um, clergy member, uh, teaching elder member of Scioto Valley Presbytery, currently serving um, uh, near Arucha, Tanzania, teaching at Tumani University Makamira, uh, which is uh, uh, a university of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania. So I'm serving ecumenically, um, which is a pretty common thing in, in mission uh, work, global mission work. I have been teaching there for years involved in this conversation because um, I realized when we got there that um, there were lots and lots of um, Zionist work happening in a country where there are almost no uh, no Jewish presence at all um, and and so I am now involved in an international ecumenical initiative that PCUSA is sponsoring about confronting Christian Zionism Doug and Mitri have both been on those calls as well, as well as a number of other folks, some of whom are in this Zoom call. Um, uh, I am grateful to take the opportunity to introduce you all to our main speaker, uh, the Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, who is the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture in Bethlehem. He served for decades as the pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, um, and was and and he served as the president of the Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land from 2011 to 2016. Uh, Mitri is a published author of many many books and editor of even more. His books include "I Am a Palestinian Christian." Bethlehem Besieged, Faith in the Face of Empire, and the Bible Through Palestinian Eyes. 
Welcome, Mitri. We're glad you're with us today and grateful for your willingness to spend time with uh, this event um, sponsored by Scioto Valley Presbytery. And Doug Dix, um, Doug Dix has been involved in work in the Middle East for a very, very long time. He's been in mission service with PCUSA for 21 years. Hallelujah. Um, and is currently serving as facilitator for education for justice and peacemaking in Israel and Palestine. Um, uh, Mitri and Doug both live in Palestine. Um, he is serving as the ecumenical an ecumenical associate with St. Andrew's Scots Memorial Presbyterian Church in Jerusalem and on the Church Council of the English-speaking Congregation of the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in the old city of Jerusalem. So um, we're going to hear from Mitri first uh, about um, uh, the topic of our webinar, which is uh, Israel and Palestine, a conversation about the issues today. And then Doug is going to follow talking specifically about where the Presbyterian Church has found itself in terms of our work, our mission in Israel and Palestine, and the stances that the Presbyterian Church is, uh, has taken. Welcome, uh, Mitri, and welcome, Doug. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia, for this introduction, and uh, greetings to uh, Makumira, uh, in Tanzania, and uh, great to see uh, our friends uh, from uh, Ohio with us. Uh, maybe Cynthia uh, doesn't know that also I served as mission partner in residence uh, with PCUSA in Louisville uh, for six months. That was in the year 2003. Um, in, um, at that time, I had uh, many trips to Ohio and I met with, uh, you know, several people of the uh, presbytery there. Um, tonight, our time, uh, morning, your time, um, I would like to uh, uh, tackle the issue of Israel-Palestine, uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, larger uh, picture um, and then move uh, closer uh, to, to Israel-Palestine. Uh, because I don't think we can talk today about Israel-Palestine without talking about what's happening uh, in the world uh, at large. Um, and so my first point, um, um, looking at the international scenery right now, if we look at what's happening in the world today, we have to realize that actually uh, the system that developed uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, seems to be coming to an end. You know, I mean, the Second World War was devastating for Europe. Uh, tens of millions of people were uh, killed in that intra-European war. And in the aftermath of that war, the international community developed some tools for peacekeeping. Uh, the whole notion of international law, uh, the Geneva Convention was developed, uh, the Human Rights Chart uh, was formulated. All of these uh, pieces were put to make sure that uh, we will not uh, face another situation like what we had in the Second World War. What is happening now is that all of these accomplishments, if I can say so, all of these accomplishments are being uh, questioned. Uh, uh, if we look at what's happening in the US, we see that all of these accomplishments are being questioned. Um, international law is not anymore that important uh, for the Trump administration. Um, the uh, American envoy to the Middle East, Greenblatt, said that international law is vague. Uh, 
Johnson uh, in 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 uh, in England, uh, the Prime Minister there, uh, you know, recently said that uh, in the connection of the Brexit uh, debate, uh, that I mean, uh, violating international law is something that we might need to do uh, to get out of Brexit. Uh, if we look at what's happening in India, uh, you know, with the rise of the right, uh, 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 Hindu uh, uh, ideology, uh, we see that same thing. Uh, if we look at Russia, I mean, the president there now, you know, will be almost forever uh, president there. Uh, if we look at China, same story. Brazil, etc. So, so we are in a very, very uh, uh, dangerous situation where actually, uh, you know, uh, these these rights that were developed after so much pain and so much suffering and so much bloodshed uh, are not anymore uh, for granted, and this actually reflects on Palestine. Uh, that today we hear many people are saying, you know, why bother about international law? Uh, why bother about the human rights of the Palestinians? Uh, it's the main thing is, you know, to gain more power. Uh, so, uh, so this is the first point I would like to make if we look at the international scene. Now, if we come closer to the region, and we look at the Arab world, uh, we see that, you know, the Arab world as is today, uh, basically uh, was developed after world, uh, 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 the First World War. Uh, it was 1917 that the two major empires of that time, France and uh, Britain, uh, decided to dismantle the Ottoman Empire, and to create uh, states that actually uh, uh, move in the orbit of one of those empires. Uh, and so they created uh, Palestine. The idea with Palestine was to give it to the European Jews. They created Transjordan, they created Lebanon, uh, they created Syria. Uh, and Iraq. All of these countries were created in the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, what we're experiencing now, actually, uh, after the so-called Arab Spring, uh, is what Condoleezza Rice called uh, uh, creative uh, disorder. Uh, and uh, so we see that many of these countries are being dismantled and broken into pieces. So uh, Palestine now is broken into three, four pieces. You have Israel, you have Gaza, you have the West Bank, uh, and then you have the uh, Jewish state within the West Bank. So like four pieces almost. If you look at uh, Syria, again, it's, uh, uh, it's not anymore united as it used to be. Iraq, same thing, at least in three pieces. Uh, Lebanon is on the edge of collapse. Uh, Jordan is still holding together. Uh, uh, and so, again, what was true for the last hundred years is not anymore true. Uh, and again, this has a reflection um, and implication uh, for Palestine uh, on many on many levels. First of all, uh, you know, the the heart of the region used to be the Mesopotamia, what we call Mesopotamia. It's the land between the Nile and the Euphrates. <coughs> uh, this is the land where civilization started. Now, these countries between the Nile and the Euphrates uh, are being dismantled. Uh, and so the land that where civilization and actually where the three monotheistic religions started 
uh, right now uh, are so weak. And the, uh, the attention is now on the Gulf states because they have the petrodollar, at least they, they used to have it for a long time. Uh, uh, and uh, they have developed to be now uh, regional players after destroying Iraq in two wars uh, with the US, uh, after dismantling Syria, after the Arab Spring with ISIS, etc. Uh, and Lebanon now we see after the blast actually that Lebanon is, I mean, is really in deep, deep trouble. Uh, so now you have basically Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, the Nile and the Euphrates, has become like a battleground for regional powers. Israel is a player, uh, Saudi Arabia is a player, Iran is a player, United Arab Emirates is a player, uh, and uh, the poor people in this region uh, actually are, are suffering and are paying uh, the price of that. In that context, uh, the other important issue is uh, militarization. Um, so basically our region uh, is spending per year uh, over hundred billion dollars in uh, weapon, uh, uh, I mean, buying weapons. Uh, Saudi Arabia pays like almost $50 billion a year for weapons. United Arab Emirates, 15 billion, Israel, 15 billion. Although Israel gets much, much more because they get lots of these toys for free from the US. Turkey uh, spends like 12 billion a year on weapons. So, so we, we experience the militarization that is benefiting actually, it's, it's, the, it's the security of the regime, it's the security of the, re, uh, of the ruler rather than human security. So uh, if we look at the people living in the region are becoming actually poorer and poorer, but the region is spending more and more uh, money on militarization and who benefits from that are basically the American and European uh, uh, military uh, industry. Uh, they are the sole uh, actually uh, benefiter from, from this uh, region. And if we look at the United Arab Emirates, uh, so-called uh, Abraham, the Abraham Accord or the Peace Accord with Israel, it's really not about peace because the United Arab Emirates and Israel, they were never in war. It's, it's part of this, uh, it's a militarization deal. It's another militarization deal. For the United Arab Emirates to get the F-35 uh, jet uh, fighters from the US, uh, they were basically obliged to make uh, peace with Israel and to make it at a point that suits Netanyahu, that is in deep trouble for corruption, etc., and suit uh, Trump uh, in his election campaign because he was, you know, uh, losing uh, lots of uh, votes and confidence uh, because of COVID-19, because of taxes and others. He needed to, to show uh, a success story and the success story uh, actually, the United Arab Emirates were ready to be the agents of this success story. So, so we look at, at, if we look at the Arab world right now, they are so uh, weak and uh, their weakness actually has consequences for Palestine because this weakens the Palestinian position even more and more uh, and give Israel uh, what they want without paying any price. Uh, so now we come to Israel-Palestine. Um, and coming to Israel-Palestine, uh, uh, 
uh, we have to realize that uh, the situation is uh, because of those changes worldwide and in the region, uh, we can see changes here as well. So what was basically uh, uh, an agreement, uh, a consensus worldwide uh, for the two states uh, is now again being questioned. It's the uh, same thing like the accomplishment of the Second World War being uh, questioned, the, the, uh, the Middle East of the First World War is being questioned, now also the two-state solution uh, is being questioned. Uh, and um, this actually gave Israel green light to move on with uh, annexation. Now, de facto annexation has been going on for so long. I mean, Israeli settlements are being expanded on daily basis. Bethlehem, as an example, is, is surrounded by 22 uh, uh, settlements that has actually stolen all the land uh, around our town. Uh, so now 86% of Bethlehem government is either under Jewish settler control or Israeli military control. So the Palestinians control only 14% of our own Bethlehem land. Uh, so the de facto annexation uh, still goes on. It's only the de jure annexation uh, is being right now uh, put on hold just for uh, a short while uh, to please uh, the United Arab Emirates and to, uh, to, to, to enable this Abraham Accord uh, to take place. Uh, and this basically will put an end to the two-state solution. Now, we should not be, uh, I mean, uh, fooled to think that, okay, the, the one-state solution is around the corner. It's not around the corner uh, uh, because there is no consensus at all uh, for a one-state solution, um, which really means that we will be going uh, into a full-fledged apartheid system um, where we will have two groups of people, almost same size, 6.5 million people, 6.5 million people on this end, Jewish and Palestinians. Uh, the, the Israeli, the Jewish Israeli, they have all the rights, they control all the resources. Uh, um, it's like the piece of a Swiss cheese where Israel gets the cheese with all the resources and land and the Palestinians are pushed in the holes without any resources or without any uh, uh, fundament uh, for survival. Uh, and uh, so this, I guess, this apartheid situation uh, will be with us for some time. Uh, as long as these changes worldwide and in the region are there, uh, we will be living in this apartheid system, but we know um, that this is not uh, the end. Uh, on the other hand, if we look on the Palestinian side, we see a, a divided uh, people, divided geographically between the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the, the uh, Palestinians, in Jerusalem and the Palestinians inside the Green Line. Uh, uh, we see a divided leadership between Hamas and Fatah, um, and we see an aging leadership. Um, um, if you look at our leadership, uh, actually most of our leaders, uh, they are in their 70s and 80s. Uh, and uh, so uh, the next generation is not yet in power. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, a, a problem. Uh, last but not least, uh, all of this has actually uh, also affects uh, the Christian church uh, worldwide and in the region. Uh, 
if we look worldwide, we see that uh, a portion of the Christian community uh, have sided with those in power. Uh, I mean, if we look today at President Trump, uh, his supporters are mainly white and Christians, uh, maybe more white than Christians, uh, but this is a very important phenomenon. If we look at uh, uh, Brazil, again, uh, those who support uh, Bolsonaro are mainly uh, Christians. Uh, his base is the Christian right. Um, and this is true also for uh, the right, uh, uh, the right uh, uh, power, uh, the right, uh, 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 the, the, the radical right in Eastern Europe. They are basically supported by the Christian community. Uh, and this is really, uh, I mean, awful because uh, then most of these groups are Christian Zionist, which really means it's not only that we have now uh, governments who are uh, not upholding anymore international law and human rights. Now we are Christians, Zionist Christians, who believe that they can violate the human rights in the name of divine rights. And so they play God against uh, the humans. And this is very dangerous. And in this uh, construct, basically, for those uh, uh, Zionist Christians, there is no problem to see the Palestinians suffering, their rights being violated, because at the end of the day for them, the Bible says so is more important than any other uh, human values. Uh, uh, and so that's on, on, on the international. And I mean, these Christian Zionists, they have lots of money. Uh, I mean, it's not like, uh, like uh, you know, suddenly uh, people are, are, uh, are getting a revelation. I mean, there is lots of investment. It's a business that being uh, invested uh, by, by the Christian right, but also by Israel uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to develop uh, and strengthen these Christian Zionist groups. Um, and our problem today, and Cynthia can talk to that, is that Christian Zionism is not anymore a, a, a phenomenon in the uh, in the so-called north, but it is a global phenomenon and it's spreading in the south. So you look at Tanzania, you will find there a growing number of Christian uh, uh, Zionists. If we look at the uh, Christian uh, church uh, in the Middle East, uh, we realize that it's not only the Middle East, but, but especially now I'm talking about the Middle East, it's a very weak uh, leadership. Uh, I would say there hasn't been such a weak leadership, Christian leadership for a long, long time. Um, and uh, we see that, uh, you know, with all what's going on, uh, many churches has lost their prophetic role. Um, um, uh, and uh, for me, this is very, very worrying. So if we look at all of this, this is, I mean, it's a very depressing uh, scenery uh, that we see here, but also worldwide. And yet, you know, I cannot leave you now just uh, depressed to go back uh, home and to, you know, to feel so depressed that it's a lost case. No, it's not a lost case. Um, for many reasons. One is uh, there are still countries who care for international rights, uh, international law for human rights. Uh, one good example is when uh, the Trump administration decided to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, no other country followed. Why? Because there are so many countries that they hesitate to uh, 
uh, violate international law because they know East Jerusalem is an occupied city. They cannot make it the capital of Israel. So, uh, so there is hope there. Uh, and we need to strengthen uh, uh, this. Uh, but also, if we look at, at the Arab world, uh, many people got depressed because the United Arab Emirates and Israel uh, stro uh, stroke this deal. But the thing is, this peace deal is a peace deal between uh, two establishments. The people on the ground, they never normalized relations with Israel as long as Israel continued to be an occupied uh, state. So, you know, uh, with, with Egypt, Israel had uh, a peace treaty since the late uh, 70s. There is no connection whatsoever between Egyptian people and Israeli people. Uh, with Jordan, uh, since over 20 years, uh, there is no, uh, 30 years even, there is no uh, connection, uh, uh, no normalization between the people, uh, the Jordanian people and the Jewish Israeli people, no normalization. Uh, and the same is actually for all other countries. So we should not think that now uh, peace is coming. There will be no peace uh, if there is no uh, uh, justice for the Palestinians. Because at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the neighbors and the people who live within Israel and, and, and in, in, in proximity to Israel in the West Bank and Gaza are the Palestinians. Uh, this is the main cause. Uh, and without justice to the Palestinians, there will be no peace uh, and no normalization. Uh, it's not a lost case because uh, the Palestinian people are very resilient people. I mean, <laughs> with all what's going on, you still have 6.5 million Palestinian people living uh, between the Jordan level and the Mediterranean in the so-called Holy Land. Uh, Israel will not be able to get rid of them. Uh, uh, I mean, we have endured so much suffering and we remained steadfast in our country. I mean, I'm speaking about myself. I could have left many, many years ago. I still get lots of invitations uh, to go teach abroad or, uh, or take a position abroad. Uh, uh, very tempting, uh, but my wife and I are committed to staying here uh, and to continue uh, to uh, strengthen this resilience of our people. Because, I mean, if there is no, uh, if there is no solution inside, the only thing we can do now is to, to stay resilient, to stay in the land. Uh, and this is important not only for us as Palestinians, but it's also important for us as Christians because uh, I believe that our, uh, our mission uh, uh, is needed now, uh, maybe more than ever. Uh, and I can see it uh, through our work with Dar al Kalama University. Uh, once you empower the young people, uh, the young people can uh, actually be the beacon of hope. Uh, maybe the older generation have failed, but uh, we have hope in the, in the next generation. And uh, our mission at the university is to educate the next generation of creative leaders in Palestine. And we chose art actually as the tools for social transformation. And we see it works. Uh, it gives people not only resilience, but it gives them also tools to communicate their story in a very effective and very creative uh, way. But also it provides them with, uh, with, with income and livelihood so that they can sustain themselves, uh, themselves on this long journey. So to sum up, uh, we are going through rough times. Uh, uh, it's like, uh, it's like uh, uh, we are right now in, in the desert. 
uh, with little water uh, and so sustaining ourselves for the long journey is really important uh, but I'm confident that uh, the day will come when we will see the promised land maybe we will not see it ourselves uh, but hopefully the next generation will see it and they will work towards it so I would like to stop here and uh, uh, I'm sure Doug has lots of things to add also from his perspective uh, and then I look forward to taking a few questions thank you very much Do you really want me to add to what you just said, Mitri? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the work uh, that I've been involved in here and the time that I've been here. Um, I first came here in 1995 to work, though I had been to Palestine as early as 1982. But um, in 1995, um, there came the opportunity to come to Palestine and work, and the job description was something like, um, uh, to um, get people down and off the bus, uh, to introduce them to Palestinians uh, and Israelis, um, and to help them to connect with issues related to social justice. Um, and so that's really what lured me here in, in uh, the fall of 1995, September of 1995, actually. And um, um, it was going to be a two-year commitment. That was what I was willing to commit to. Um, and it's been over 21 years now. So really, um, my role here, as well as that of um, the Reverend Dr. Victor McCary, who works um, in conjunction with Reverend Mitri Rahe in a program called Religion and State, um, is really to be a critical presence at a critical time. Um, we've come alongside our friends and our partners um, uh, here in uh, the Holy Land, and we want to be supportive of the Christian presence and witness um, in my role, um, my role was actually to allow and to facilitate face-to-face -face meetings with Palestinians and Israelis. Now, keep in mind, uh, in the fall of 1995, we were only two years into the Oslo Accords. Um, and now, what, 28 years have passed since the Oslo Accords were signed. Um, and um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. So uh, I serve actually, in, and I wear two hats. Um, my title with the Presbyterian Church is Facilitator for Education for Justice and Peacemaking. So this is really what I'm doing now as a continuation um, of what I started back in 1995 when I worked with the Middle East Council of Churches in a small office called um, the Ecumenical Travel Office of the Middle East Council of Churches. And it was an ecumenical movement. I worked with a, a UCC Disciples of Christ couple I had a Methodist colleague, I had another uh, Presbyterian, um, and I worked with um, uh, an Australian girl from the Uniting Church in Australia. And this was really our mission and our mandate, was to get people down and off the bus um, to meet with, uh, with Palestinians and Israelis and to hear um, in their own uh, voices, with their own voices, uh, a little bit about the contemporary situation that was unfolding in the Holy Land. And keep in mind that in, in 1995, there was a lot of euphoria and there was a lot of optimism um, that peace was going to break out, that there was going to be this mutual historic reconciliation between both peoples. Um, and of course, um, that, that really didn't happen. Um, as I said, I arrived in September of 95 and in early November of the same year, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by a right-wing um, Orthodox Jew who basically wanted to um, end the peace process. He felt that the process was going too quickly, that Israel was giving too away, and um, he was the person who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. So as I said, uh, we, uh, we have provided unique opportunities for Western Christians to basically meet with and put a face on who Palestinian Christians are uh, and Palestinians in general. Um, and through tourism um, and the expansion of the tourist industry, 
it allowed Palestinians to earn an equitable income from tourism. Um, they could sell and market Palestinian hotels, restaurants, guest houses, and Palestinian crafts. Um, and a significant portion of what we consider to be the Holy Land today actually lies in what is today uh, the West Bank, um, uh, which is, of course, Palestine. And uh, we also write about, talk about um, uh, Palestine and Palestinian through Facebook, through photography, through newsletters, uh, and continue to put the face of who the people of Palestine are, and particularly the Palestinian Christian community. And the goal really is to change the hearts and the minds, not only of Presbyterians, but anyone that we encounter um, and anybody that we have the chance to educate. Um, you know, it, it, it basically is trying to, um, to change the narrative um, and to let people really think about who is a terrorist and who is a freedom fighter. And of course, the, the Palestinian Christians um, through Kairos Palestine um, and other organizations have said and have pled with us that they want Western Christians to come and see and then to go and tell what they've seen. Just share your story. Just tell your story. Tell people what you've seen and what you've heard and what you've witnessed. Um, my role is also here to participate in the life and the liturgy of the church. And I do that by uh, serving as an ecumenical associate at St. Andrew's Church of Scotland in Jerusalem. Um, the Church of Scotland is the, the church that sponsors my, my visa to be here, and I serve as an elder in the Presbyterian Church USA, um, because as Presbyterians we don't have bishops, as you know. So that is really uh, my role with the Scottish Presbyterian Church. And in church, it gives us another opportunity to speak with and to meet with Western visitors about the contemporary situation um, in Palestine and for Palestinians. And uh, we can mention things and talk about things such as uh, occupation and confiscation and demolitions and things that, um, that the average tourist that comes here do not encounter. You know, Israel has a, a travel circuit that they do where people are picked up at the airport. Um, they go straight to Galilee. They come to Jerusalem and Bethlehem later. And the time that they spend in Bethlehem and in the West Bank is very limited. Um, and so we have had the opportunity to help change that. Um, and of course, the situation for tourism in general has changed and changed that because Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, they've not built any new hotels. So all of the new hotels that have been and were being built are here in Bethlehem. Um, it's also cheaper to stay in Bethlehem. Um, people can get out at night and walk around and feel safe and feel comfortable and can uh, meet people. And so, uh, and we've seen the results of that. Um, of course, now we're living with a pandemic, but I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So, uh, as I said before, uh, it's 28 years now since the Oslo Accords were signed, and there was this euphoria that peace was going to break out. And all of the difficult are the final status issues. Uh, they were they called them difficult issues, and so therefore they left them as final status issues. Um, have still not been resolved. And those issues are Jerusalem, and, and each, each, of the, each of the ones I'm going to mention could have a subcategory that we could talk about for a long, long time. Um, the, the issue of Jerusalem, um, access to the city, um, who owns what in Jerusalem? Are you talking about West Jerusalem? Are you talking about East Jerusalem? Are you talking about Jerusalem, the holy city, the walled city? Are you talking about metropolitan Jerusalem? Are you talking about greater Jerusalem? Um, so m many different issues, um, and also the properties, the 1948 properties, the homes of Palestinians that still um, exist in Jerusalem, where Israeli Jews now live, um, and Palestinians have never received just compensation for those properties, so that's also another issue. The issue of water, and this has been a very hot summer uh, for many people. And I know that many, many households have struggled with the issue of water and getting equitable water. And when water has to be bought by the Palestinians, they pay four times what the Israelis would pay for the same water. Um, the Israeli settlements that, be, that are being built around Bethlehem have running water 24-7. But 
uh, in the summer months here when it's very hot, many of the of the residences and the buildings run out of water and uh, they have to call and get a water tank and someone has to go door to door to collect for um, the water. And then the building doesn't get any new water until it's released from the municipality. And they can't get it from the municipality unless the municipality is getting it from Israel. Um, Nietzsche mentioned the issue of Israeli settlements and the settlements that are surrounding Bethlehem. Bethlehem has a bypass road to the west. Uh, there's a new road being built to the east called the American Road, which is going to connect up with Jerusalem and Hebron. And the road to the west is going to connect the road from Hebron to the Menachem Begin Boulevard and straight to Tel Aviv. So between the settlements to the north and to the south and to the east and the bypass roads, Bethlehem is really surrounded. Um, another issue is the Palestinian refugee, the refugees that fled in 1948, and at the time it was 750,000. Um, and now worldwide, Palest the Palestinian population is about 5 million. They're not all refugees, but um, again, compensation for, um, for the refugees for what they lost in 1948. The final borders of the state of Israel, where are the final borders? When the late Yitzhak Rabin was asked, where are the borders of the state of Israel? He said, the borders of the state of Israel are where the Israeli army now stands. Uh, and at the time they were ensconced in the Golan Heights, um, which is occupied territory from Syria. They were in Sinai, they were in Gaza and in the West Bank. So um, the issue of final borders. And then there's a sixth final status issue, which is the, the condition of and the release of Palestinian political prisoners. The prisoners that Israel says uh, they have Jewish or Israeli blood on their hands will never be released. Um, so that tends to be so again, all of these issues, these six issues, have never been resolved in the 28 years of, of uh, Oslo. Actually, as I said, we're in the post-Oslo. So now we come to 2020 or 2020, and uh, we have a COVID-19 virus. Um, and at first, there was very good cooperation between um, Israel and the Palestinians in order to get the virus under control. And now there's none. There's been a there's been a complete cutoff of relations between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, and the number of cases in both Israel and the Palestinian Authority are rising. So how we're going to, um, how, how we and they are going to deal with that. But really, uh, it, it really comes down to an issue of justice. And so we work with justice-based organizations, such as Kairos Palestine, such as Darat Kalima, um, um, uh, Sabil, uh, and with the, with the Christian presence here in the Holy Land to continue to talk about the issue of justice for the 6.5 million Palestinians that are in the land. And at the same time, we're also dealing with the phenomenon of Christian Zionism, which actually isn't a new phenomenon. It's been around for, for many years, but now you have a president in the White House who adheres to this uh, theology of Christian Zionism. And uh, there are many Christians who believe that the bloodier the conflict becomes in the Middle East, the closer we are to the end of times and therefore the coming of Christ, as if uh, mankind can somehow manipulate uh, Christ into uh, coming sooner than he wants to. So uh, it, it really is sort of a, an apocalyptic view of, of what's happening in the contemporary Middle East. And um, yeah, and um, uh, Luciano Kovacs, who is the air coordinator for the Middle East in Europe, um, has initiated a, um, um, a discussion about Christian Zionism. And we have two different groups, a, a group that's dealing with the historical narrative of Christian Zionism, and another that's dealing with the theology of, of Christian Zionism. And um, unfortunately, we talk about Christian Zionists and we say them, but I know for a fact they exist in the Presbyterian Church. There are people that adhere to this theology, uh, and so we have to we have to come up with a way and find a way that we can we can address the phenomenon of Christian Zionism uh, by saying we need we need to be able to talk to people um, and speak a language that that they understand um, and uh, and um, and do it rather forcefully, yeah, but but out of love. So uh, anyway. I think I will stop there. I've gone through uh, most of my notes uh, and I'll look forward to your questions. 
Thank you so much, Doug. Um, encourage you folks to put things into your Q&A. I'm going to unmute um, and invite to Mitri um, and actually to Cynthia um, to be with us in conversation depending on what your questions might be. Um, so I encourage you to write those into the to the Q&A at this point. Um, one that uh, we can start with that really tags just what you were talking about, Doug. You mentioned the, the number of, of Christians who feel, as you said, the bloodier the conflict in the Middle East, the sooner Jesus will return. I, in, in my perspective, there's an even larger number of, of Christians who just sort of assume the default position of Christians should be pro-Israel. It's just that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to be pro-Israel. How? What can we say? Well, how do how do we begin to have the conversation with folks that they should even care? Um, isn't it true that you know that that God said you know blessed are those who bless Israel? So what do we what can we say? So um, any of the three of you that want to jump in on that, and then others encourage you to write your questions into the Q and A. Um, I'll let sure you start have, since you were, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a direct answer to what, what, your, um, what your question is, but I, what I would like to say is that, that we are by and large to blame for this also because uh, the work that now should have been done uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And, um, you know, we had seminary groups that were bringing students here and they were going to archaeological sites and they weren't meeting with Palestinian Christians, and they weren't going to church on Sunday morning, uh, and they were visiting Masada instead. And so when this phenomenon was sort of uh, being born, if you will, um, we were actively participating in it. Uh, and we were not um, providing the opportunities that we started doing in the mid 90s, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And I think we lost a good 20 years um, that we could have really gained from from that. So, um, and there, of course, there are many different resources. And part of our working group is is coming up with um, much of what's been written because a lot has been written. Unfortunately, more has been written in favor of uh, the, the theology of, of of this end times uh, this end times theology by people such as uh, John Hagee and. Um, Oh, who's the author of the late great planet Earth? How, how, how Lindsay, I think. Yeah. So um, we should have been confronting it then, and no one really took it seriously. And as I said, we we actively participated by not doing the education for our um, for our denomination. Okay. Thanks, um, Mitri. You have anything to to add to that? I don't know, Mitri, you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess, uh, you know, the most important question is what do we understand uh, under Israel? Uh, uh, it's a blasphemy if you think that the Israel of the Bible is the state of Israel today. Uh, because you are, uh, you are mixing between uh, faith and ideology, which is something that is very dangerous. In fact, uh, the whole story of the Bible is the story of a small group of people, uh, irrespective of their uh, religious uh, background, uh, who were actually surrounded by empires. And the whole Bible is just, you know, uh, uh, you know, the struggle with the question, where are you, God, when the empires keep trampling us? And this question today is asked by the Palestinians. So today, actually, the Palestinians of today, they live in a similar context like the Israelites of the Bible. So if you want to understand what the gospel is really about, you have to listen to the Palestinians, not to the Israeli who are empire by proxy. All right, thanks. Um, Cynthia, do you want to add, um, you've done written, edited books on Christian Zionism. Um, what, what can we say to people who assume that Christians should be pro-Israel? What kind of response? What's a beginning point of conversation there? 
Uh, I'm trying to start my video here. There we go. Um, uh, as I said at the top, you know, when we moved to uh, Tanzania in 2017, we were just really stunned to see how many um, signs on businesses and and little uh, transport vans that people take around the city um, said, God bless Israel, pray for Israel. Um, Tanzania is a very poor country um, and it's surrounded by other poor countries um, where uh, the poverty around Tanzania impacts Tanzanians. Um, the, the conflict in Congo, the, the poverty in Sudan, um, uh, illness in other countries like Ebola has a huge impact on the life and health and welfare of people in Tanzania. Yet we were not seeing pray for Sudan or pray for Congo, uh, pray for the end of Ebola, we were seeing, and, and you can still see, pray for Israel, God bless Israel. Um, uh, so uh, the, the reality is that, um, uh, which uh, we have come to understand through research, is that American organizations, largely American organizations, uh, have been very active in Africa um, because Africa has 54 votes at the United Nations. That's, that's just where it is. Um, uh, and, um, and there are many Christians in Africa. Uh, Africa is a place where Christianity is, is growing. Um, uh, so, um, uh, consequently, um, uh, Africa is seen as valuable um, uh, for what it can offer to other people, including Israel. And uh, Christian Zionist organizations are very involved and interested politically um, uh, in what's going on in Israel-Palestine. It is, it is really stunning to talk to Tanzanian pastors who have a clear sense that blessing Israel is what is necessary for Tanzania to prosper. Um, that Tanzania's economy will fail unless we, um, uh, we all bless Israel. And that is a direct quote from Genesis 12.3a, just the first part of Genesis 12.3. Um, so it's uh, for, for our work in Tanzania, it has been a very uh, interesting part of um, a, a facet of this work that, that um, to be pro-Israel is just pro forma there. It's, it's not even questioned. Um, I did want to ask, since I'm on right now, Mitri and Doug, can you speak more about um, what is being um, promoted here in the U.S. as peacemaking efforts? Part of, of the new um, uh, Day of Peace that is being um, encouraged and promoted by the Trump administration, and particularly by Jared Kushner, the, the president's son-in-law, um, with the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. And, and what does this mean um, in terms of how the Palestinians who are um, uh, related in some ways, or, or who are Arab peoples, and Arab people, how, how where does this move the ball or does it move the ball or how how do the palestinians see these moves on the part of the us and the uae and bahrain and i'm going to turn my video off so one of you gentlemen can uh see who i spotlight first all right doug <laughs> <laughs> I've been spotlighted, so I guess I'll begin. <laughs> but I want to go back, if I may, and I hate to take the time, but I want to go back to the issue of Tanzania and Christian Zionism in Africa, uh, because uh, these, are the, these are the people that are basically being marketed by the Israeli tourism system and who we see here in the hottest months of summer when there are no other tourists. And many of them get a free trip to come to Israel, paid for by the government, by their government, uh, and so they come here and fill up the Israeli hotels. They keep the Israeli tour guides working. Um, they keep uh, Israeli bus drivers employed. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it now, but maybe we can talk about it later. But keep in mind now, uh, not only is tourism non-existent in Palestine, it's also non-existent in Israel. So it's having a huge economic impact uh, on both 
both economies. Um, regarding the situation with the UAE and Bahrain, I think Mitri touched upon this, and uh, if you've been following it, um, you you know more or less what Mitri said. It's a it's a business deal. It's a normalization, uh, and I keep, I mean, it, it, no one's talking and saying that it's a peace deal. They're saying it's a normalization between the two countries. So it's business. It means that the UAE is going to get those fighter jets eventually from the United States. It means it's going to open up markets that have never been opened up to Israel uh, in the, the Far East. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a business deal. And, and mark my word, and you can say that you heard it here, there will be a diplomatic incident eventually when these Israelis do get to fly uh, to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and sit in these uh, hotels and restaurants, uh, because Israelis are not exactly a gentle people, uh, not like the Emiratis, and they're a bit loud, and um, it, 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 it's, it's going to be a diplomatic incident, mark my word, in, in terms of the way they behave. Uh, Emiratis are not going to come to Israel to shop. They have some of the best shopping in the world. Uh, go to the Mall of the Emirates or Dubai Mall, and uh, I mean, the high-end shops that are there are, 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 are nothing, I mean, Israel has nothing to rival them. So they're not coming to shop. Some of them may come uh, to pray at Al-Aqsa, but the, the population of the Emirates, and I'm talking about the indigenous population, is relatively small um, compared with the, the number of Israelis that probably would love to get on a, a plane now and be able to travel. But keep in mind that they're, they're just as much uh, earthbound as the people in Gaza are. They're not, they're not able to travel. So um, yeah, I, I really see it as a, it's opening up markets. It's, 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 a, it's a business deal. And the more that the, the more countries in the Middle East that, that give in, that cave in, that, that go along with this normalization, there will be money to be made from this. It's hard to, just, it, it's hard to think negatively about, about a deal where two countries are quote unquote making peace. But again, it's, it's more or less about normalization. And if you think about um, the, the, actual, the actual peace deal that happened between Egypt and Israel and Jordan and Israel, there are many more Israelis that have visited Jordan and Egypt than there are Egyptians and Jordanians that have come to Israel. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, we do have some questions coming up in our Q&A, so I want to make sure we get to some of those. Um, we have a... Um, uh, when uh, visiting Palestinian, excuse me, when visiting Palestine last November, another guest from the national office was distressed because when he speaks out in solidarity with Palestinians, he's called anti-Semitic, which is extremely distressing. Do you have any advice on how to thread that needle? I was going to let Mitri speak because I think I spoke too much for the last question. I, I don't believe it was too much at all, but we will... Um, We'll have Mitri spotlight Mitri then, and if you want to. Um, well, and because it was an ELCA colleague, I think maybe Mitri can address. There you go. So Mitri, how do we handle when we're um, referred to as anti-Semitic when we speak pro-Palestinian? Mitchell, did you, you got the question? How, uh, how do we, when we're called anti-Semitic? Yes, yes I, yes, I got it, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, here I answer actually uh, with the um, Sermon of the Mount, when Jesus said, blessed are you. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I think we may have frozen a connection here. I'm thrilled to win as long as we did. Try, can you try again, Mitri? We lost you there for a minute. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the internet is very unstable. Yes. Uh, so what I was saying is that I would answer with the uh, Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are you uh, if they uh, 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 say false things against you. Uh, 
Uh, and, but this is a tactic that Israel is using to silence people who, are, uh, who have a prophetic voice. Uh, and I mean, you know, if you read the whole Bible, uh, prophets had always tough times. I mean, they were, weren't like the people who, people just like loved them. They were in, they had to face lots of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, accusations, etc. Uh, uh, and so I would say uh, people should not be deterred through this. Uh, they should continue uh, as long as they know, you know, what they are telling about is really the truth, uh, that their compass is justice, not ideology, uh, and that, uh, you know, fighting for the rights of the Palestinians uh, is, at the end of the day, uh, uh, good for Israel long term, uh, because occupation uh, is not good, uh, not only not good for the Palestinians, but also it's not good for the Israeli. Thanks. Um, Doug, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I would just say, um, and, I, and I have been accused of this at certain times, but not much. Um, but I can, I can honestly say that working with both Palestinians and Israelis, I could probably introduce you to uh, Israelis who are being called anti-Semitic or traitors by their own people. So uh, these, are, these are titles that are being thrown on people. And again, the issue is basically to try and silence them. And anybody who knows that their, that their facts and their statistics speak for themselves uh, has nothing to fear. So I, I don't worry about that too much. All right, thanks. A um, Couple of the questions. Um, is there, um, what are your thoughts, again, Mitri and, and Doug, on the BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement um, of the PCUSA. It's controversial to a lot of Presbyterians, but can you, can you speak, speak briefly to that? Um, I can maybe start uh, just okay. saying that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, when you say controversial, uh, just one second, okay. Uh, when you say controversial, uh, people think this is negative. Uh, but for me, controver Jesus was controversial. Uh, um, and so uh, one should not fear of being controversial. And uh, knowing the PCUSA for so long, the PCUSA was uh, boycotting uh, sweat t-shirts uh, already 30, 40 years ago. Uh, nobody spoke anything against it. Uh, today you have uh, sanctions against Iran and against Syria and you have now sanctions against the Palestinians. Uh, nobody actually, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, uh, is challenging that. So why is Israel the exception always? Uh, uh, at the end of the day, people have to decide uh, where to put their money. Uh, and if their money is being used uh, to support things that uh, support injustice, they should, as responsible people, actually not invest in anything that violates human rights, international law, uh, climate, uh, exploit uh, people, uh, uh, you know, using child labor. I mean, all of these kinds of things, uh, we always uh, tell people to actually to to put their money where their mouth is, and so this is what really uh, PDS is all about. Great, thank you, D Doug. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, there are several things that come to mind when you talk about the Presbyterians and BDS. First of all, um, I remember when that happened, and I don't think that the Presbyterians did a very good job of telling their own story. Uh, as I recall, that was a really controversial year. We had some layoffs. Uh, we lost a lot of people in the Presbyterian News Service. And so we basically allowed the international press to tell our story, to tell what we did, rather than, um, and we had weak leadership at the top too, I'll say that. Uh, and so people were backing down and shying away from the controversy and the criticism around the issue. 
Um, and when we finally did vote uh, to divest, we should have told what we did and why. Um, we did not divest from Israel because we don't have any money invested in Israel. We have money invested in multinational companies that do business in Israel. And to my knowledge, um, we're still invested in those companies. And the money or the, the companies from which we, which we voted to divest from, which were Caterpillar, Motorola, and Hewlett Packard, to my knowledge, that, that stock still has not been uh, sold. <laughs> so we voted to divest, but we haven't actually divested. I think, and I think I'm, I think I'm right about that. But, but I could write to Rob Four and find out. So yeah, but I mean, I'm like Mitri. Put your money where your mouth is. What Christian thinks that um, that um, investing in a a specially built bulldozer that is being used to demolish Palestinian homes and uh, uproot olive trees is a good investment. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll just close by saying, if, if we had really had the money and we were serious about this, wouldn't it, have been, wouldn't it have been great if we could have brought a Palestinian family or a couple of Palestinian farmers whose homes were demolished by the bulldozer to our General Assembly? And by the same token, wouldn't it have been great if we had brought people from, from Caterpillar to the West Bank? Uh, to see uh, that that kind of money and that kind of uh, that action taking place, I think that have been been much more powerful, and I think it could have turned the tide of of thinking against the church. So again, I think we did a, a very poor job of telling our own story and what happened. Thanks, thanks, Doug. Uh, some more questions: Is there any emerging new Palestinian younger leadership? What is the uh, dynamic there? Um, uh, yes, actually, I mean, uh, uh, there is uh, an emerging uh, young leaders in, in so many uh, spectrums. I mean, politically, uh, although they are not yet in power, but for example, if you look at, at, at right now, at most of the Palestinian ambassadors abroad, they are young, talented, very well educated, articulate uh, people, and I can see many of them actually in, in excellent leadership position. Uh, if we look uh, uh, at our college, I see lots of these young people are emerging as uh, you know the the filmmakers that are going to you know tell the Palestinian story in new ways. Uh, the artists, the musicians, uh, uh, etc. If you if we look at the church, uh, I see also several young leaders uh, also emerging uh, there. Uh, I see young women. Uh, this is really uh, important. Uh, uh, today, uh, 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 the majority of the emerging leaders are women. Uh, and for me, this is a very important sign of hope. Okay, thanks. Uh, Doug, you wanna chime in any, anything else on that? No, I think uh, Mitri said it all. Um, uh, and, and he said it in his talk when he talked about the, um, the, um, the aging population of the, of the Palestinian leadership. So, um, I would just echo that and say that we need some of these, some of the elderly to step aside uh, and give opportunity to uh, some of the younger people who um, are very well educated, who are very capable, um, and uh, yeah, would be and, and are very articulate about the about the Palestinian situation. Thanks. A um, couple more. I'm going to sort of combine two questions. Is there any hope for moving forward? on the peace accord, um, as well as what's considered to be a positive series of events towards aiding and liberating the Palestinians in the coming year. So um, I know, Mitri, you, you, you did your best, try to not leave us too depressed um, <laughs> at the end. Um, can you speak any more about, about what kind of hope is there? What, what are some, what are some um, bright things to look forward to um, and how can Americans help? Um, I, I think, I mean, let me take the, 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 the later part, how can American help? Because uh, I think this is an important question. Um, 
Uh, I like to talk about the five P's, uh, what Americans can do. Um, the first P you can get, sorry, it's prayers. Um, it's really, we need your prayers. It's important to pray for uh, justice and peace in this region. Uh, whenever I go to a Presbyterian church and, you know, usually they, they pray for uh, Israel, Palestine when I'm there. Uh, I listen to how they pray because that tells me how aware they are. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when the disciples ask Jesus, teach us to pray, uh, we need to teach uh, congregations how really to pray for justice. Do they pray for justice or do they pray for peace? Uh, do they pray for Palestine or do they pray only for Israel? Do they pray only for the Christians or do they pray for everyone? So, I mean, these are things that we need to learn. So P, prayers. The second are pilgrimages. And I think Doug talked about a lot about it. We need more groups to come to know the situation. And uh, we need now groups to come uh, as soon as the, we are over with the COVID-19 because, you know, Bethlehem, uh, uh, economy depends to 70% on tourism. There are 33,000 people in Bethlehem living on tourism and they have no income now for like uh, six months and unfortunately tourism will not resume uh, even in 2021. So, so they will have no income and I see today actually one of the major uh, souvenir shops in Bethlehem uh, um, he brought uh, uh, fruits and vegetables to sell there uh, as protest to what's happening because, you know, there is no income and there is no uh, light at the end of the tunnel for the tourism industry. So we need groups to come as soon as possible. The third is political advocacy. Uh, we need your, your, your voice. Uh, we need your vote. Uh, your representatives should know that Palestine matters. Um, your representatives sh should know that justice matters, that it is important for you. Uh, the fourth P uh, uh, are uh, projects. Um, what projects can you support? Can you support a, a scholarship for students? Can you support uh, uh, planting trees? Uh, uh, can you, I mean, we need very concrete projects because remember uh, the U.S. invests uh, right now $3.8 billion a year in Israel. Um, and uh, the Trump administration had, has cut all aid to Palestine. I mean, we lost two projects uh, that uh, we were supposed to get through uh, American uh, schools and hospitals abroad. Uh, uh, we were supposed to get a new educational facilities and upgrade the library. And uh, President Trump said no, no funds should go to Palestine. So we need projects uh, to be invested there. And last but not least, products. Uh, right now, when many uh, actually souvenir shops cannot, they don't have tourists to come, uh, people can shop online and actually uh, we have on a website where people can also uh, purchase uh, things that our students produce, uh, jewelry, glass, ceramic, etc. Et uh, now we have actually our, our hit right now uh, are masks uh, with Palestinian embroidery. It's the idea that one of our innovative students, female students came up with uh, and now, you know, you see people running around with masks with Palestinian embroidery on them. Again, another, another way to tell our story. Can you put that, uh, the website for that online products, can you put that in the chat? Yeah. So folks can have that if that's something they would mm -hmm. like to look at. Um, great. Um, another question, uh, I think Doug is good for this one, is the PCUSA Israel-Palestine Mission Network still active? And what are congregations who are involved? I'm asking, what what congregations are involved and still in touch with you, or what what more do we need to know about that? 
Yes, we have a very vibrant and a very active uh, Israel-Palestine mission network. They're still very active. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're planning for their annual meeting, which will be in, I think, November. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, of course, they were the ones who, who put out, um, what, four different resources uh, to educate Presbyterians about Palestine. The first one was called Steadfast Hope. Sorry, the first one was called The Cradle of Our Faith. But the second publication was called Steadfast Hope. The third one was Zionism Unsettled. And the fourth one was Why Palestine Matters, the Struggle to End Colonialism. So, um, yeah, they've been very active. And, and some of the other denominations have actually taken those publications um, and used them for their own denominations. Um, so, yes, they're still very active. Um, I, I hear from, uh, of course, the network, people that are part of the network. And, um, yeah, individuals that are... are, are um, are involved in the network. Um, they've supported me, and um, yes, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in regular touch with a lot of people from the network. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got a reminder of some of the things that we had also in the chat. Uh, Katie Kinnison made a, a, a recommendation of uh, Mitri's books, as well as uh, Walter Brueggemann's book, Chosen reading the Bible amid the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and so I would commend um, Brueggemann's books as well as Mitri's books um, to you. And um, a, a couple other comments, uh, one from a, a Jewish American person who's listening. Uh, and I have fellow Jews imply I'm anti-Semitic or self-hating from our pro-Palestinian activity. When actually my reformed Jewish upbringing is a reason why I must be involved in Palestinian liberation is a violation of our faith to let this continue. Keep doing this holy work. So I wanted to be sure to share that, uh, to see that our, our panelists caught that as well. Um, so as we finish up, uh, I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, any final words um, for Doug or Mitri? Um, the other thing, while they are finishing up, I would invite um, our, our attendees to put in the, uh, in the chat, probably is the easiest, um, we've mentioned a couple of times other, other conversations to have, um, annexation and settlements, uh, Jerusalem, Christian Zionism, uh, and then we had the list of, of um, water equity, uh, final borders. If there are any of those topics that are particularly appealing to you, uh, if you put them in the chat and we would be, you know, interested in organizing other conversations about some of these things. So, um, Anyway, as you're finishing that up, then um, I'll let each of you just finish with a statement or two. Um, and Doug, since you're in the spotlight, I'll let you go first. Lucky me. Well, uh, keep in mind that, you know, the world is in the, the midst of this global pandemic. Um, and yes, we're experiencing a huge downturn in tourism, as, as are so many other countries and so many other places in the world. Um, and the... And the um, the devastating effect that is happening on people and people's lives is um, is disturbing, especially as we go into the fall and and potentially this second wave. So, um, but I'm still here. Um, we're still here. The Presbyterian Church is still here. Um, we still value our partnerships and our relationships. We're going to continue to tell the stories, um, and um, yeah, just pray for us and pray for our partners and pray for our friends. Um, because we're also living um, with this big question mark over our heads. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but um, we're still here and, and we're still eager to do the work for which we were sent to do. Thank you so much. Mitri? Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for arranging this and uh, for all the people who took time uh, to be with us uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, we value the partnership that we have with uh, PCUSA. Um, PCUSA uh, have been faithful partners uh, throughout the years, and we are grateful for that. Um, and um, the last thing I would like to say is, uh, really, at the end of the day, it's not about Palestine. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about uh, justice uh, everywhere. Uh, so for me, the, the plight of the African-Americans in the U.S. 
uh, that we have been, you know, this is our, our plight as well. And this is part of my struggle. When I think of the Native American in the US, uh, these are also my people. I feel very strong connection to them. So really, it's at the end of the day, it's not about Palestine. It's about working together towards a more just peace. We know that we will not be able to have paradise on earth, but uh, uh, we are called uh, actually uh, not to be peace talkers, but peacemakers and peacemaking will not come without justice uh, for all those uh, oppressed. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to um, to say um, as we finish up our time here. Again, uh, for those it put in the chat, if there's things you'd like to know more about or have further conversations on. Um, I just would say thank you on behalf of the planning committee. Thank you very much, um, our friends, uh, Mitri and uh, Doug, for your time, uh, for coming to us uh, in the evening after your working day, uh, which uh, your working days spread into the evening um, when we do these kinds of things. So I'm very grateful. And, um, and we are very grateful. And we're grateful for all those who have uh, taken the time to take part in this uh, today. Um, one, one side effect of the pandemic is that we can do these kinds of things without getting on an airplane and, and uh, going a long distance. So we're very, very grateful and, um, and we will continue to hold you in prayer. All right. Thank you. Yes, again, thank you all very much. Thank you, Cynthia, um, as well for getting us started on this, Dimitri and Doug. And thanks to all of you for your participation and um, your good questions and all of the, the thoughtful conversation that we've had. We really appreciate it. So thank you so much um, and have a good sleep for Doug and Mitri. The rest of us still have half a day to go. So um, it was lovely to see everyone and thank you again for being here. Thank you.